Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar named One Conflict, Four Points of View, hosted by the Leon Charney Resolution Center. My name is Ophir Hanan, and I will be your moderator this evening. I was born and raised in a small town in central Israel and lived in the USA for eight years of my childhood. I was part of the inaugural class of the Eastern Mediterranean International School, a boarding school with youth from around the world in Hakfar Erok, Israel, that's mission is to make education a force for peace and sustainability in the Middle East, promoting peace through personal connections. This upcoming fall, I will begin to study communications at the IDC Herzliya International School of Communications. As one who aims to make her mark in the International Communication Society, what I believe will bring a change is the power of healthy and open dialogue. I also firmly believe in the approach of focusing on future endeavors rather than trying to reconcile for errors of the past. I have been working at the Leon Charney Resolution Center for the past two years as the coordinator of the Ambassador Program, a program that strives to build a network system and serve as a supportive platform for any youth who have a project in mind that they feel will serve their community and steer it towards change or teach them about conflict resolution. The Leon Charney Resolution Center was founded by Ms. Tilly Charney five years ago, who envisioned creating a better today and tomorrow by founding a safe space dedicated to conducting civil discourse using diplomatic skills in the spirit of Mr. Leon Charney, who played an important role as an unofficial advisor to President Carter as part of his behind the scenes role in the Camp David Accords. Events like the one today serve as an integral part of our center's mission. We encourage open discussions about diverse opinions amidst our ongoing effort to resolve conflict. And now, without further ado, let me please introduce our speakers. Professor Oren Niftachel, Chair of Urban Studies at Ben Gurion University in Be'er Sheva, Israel, representing the position of the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. Professor Asad Ghanim, Professor of Comparative Politics, School of Political Sciences at the University of Haifa, presenting the position of a one-state solution. Mr. Gilad Sher, Senior Israeli Peace Negotiator and former Prime Minister Chief of Staff, presenting the position of promoting a reality of two states through transitional Israeli-Palestinian disengagement, and Brigadier General Israela Oron, former Deputy of National Security Advisor, who will present the position of a two-state solution. Before we get started, I would like to note that everyone's mics shall be muted throughout the entire session. We encourage you to ask your questions in the chat box below, and they will be presented to our speakers accordingly. My coworker, Shana Hasbon, an ambassador in the Charney Center, will be presenting the questions at the end. We will now present a video of the Center's annual peace simulation at MS in order to start our panel. Success is not to defeat your enemy, not to defeat the other side. A success is a good solution, the best solution for both sides. So, hopefully you will learn a lot. Hopefully it will be a successful negotiation. Good luck and let the negotiations begin. Yeah. If there are, like, Gaza will be part of Palestine, so how people from Palestine will go to uh, area A, B and C? Area A, B and C unite under Palestinian plus, they gain access to Gaza. And then the rest is Israel, and it would be kind of the uh, basis for like future cooperation. It would be a neutral zone where, like, whenever whoever wants to go in could go in, and then we could separate west and east. East goes to the Palestinian, west goes to the Israeli. This is going to the Palestinian state, and this is going to the Israeli state. The big settlements will come. To the big settlements coming to Israel. Yeah. Jordan Valley going to Palestine, and uh, Jerusalem is divided. No checkpoints inside of the West Bank. No checkpoints. No checkpoints. First thing that we agreed is that uh, paramilitary groups on both sides would give up weapons. Dividing Jerusalem into east and west. We decided on a two-state solution. We felt like it was the most realistic one that will uh, not enable any discrimination against any of the sides. Education, technology, agricultural effort. Financial aid to clean the water from the Jordan River entering Palestine. Assist Israel in giving funds and water to Palestine. 
assist in the cleaning of the Sea of Gaza. The holy city will be administrated by a religious council, including representatives of Judaism, uh, in this case Christianity, and Islam. Israel moved 17% who live in Israel to West Jerusalem or other part of Israel in a process to 5 or 10 years, which will be the deadline. In cases where refugees decide to move into Palestine, they have the right to live in houses of the small settlements which were previously removed by the Israeli government. The Israeli delegation accepted to recognize Palestine as a state. Jerusalem will belong to neither side. It will not be Israel, so it will not be Palestine. Jerusalem will be an international city. For us, we decided to go for a one-state solution, which was uh, a federation. Since it was a federation, we could not continue with the same names, such as Israel or Palestine, since it was one, uh, one state. So we made a new name, which is the Eastern Mediterranean United Federation. Now, if each speaker could briefly represent his or her point of view for three minutes in reference to the students' points of views in the video. Uh, Ms. Israela, if you may start, please. The capital of... Uh of Israel and also the capital of uh, Jerusalem, of uh, Palestine. And the Holy Basin would be managed by an international entity. The third problem, which is the refugees, they will, they will uh, uh, if they want to return, they will return to Palestine and they will get uh, compensation uh, regarding the refugeehood and also compensation for their property. Uh, the main issue about the security arrangement is uh, that the Palestinian state will be demilitarized state. Um, this is basically the principles of a two-state solution. And uh, to be honest, uh, we didn't succeed in reaching this kind of an arrangement. Nevertheless, uh, it doesn't mean that this is not the right solution. In fact, that it is uh, difficult now more than ever uh, to uh, implement it doesn't mean that we need to change our goal. Uh, maybe we were the leaders or both countries were not uh, ready for concessions, necessary concessions at the same time zone. And uh, maybe there was not a third parties that was uh, uh, viewed as an honest broker by the two sides, uh, like the, the current uh, Trump claim. Uh, and maybe there are others, other reasons why it didn't uh, mature to uh, arrange uh, some kind of a solution in a deal between the two sides. However, we need to examine all the solutions that will be presented to you by a few criteria. First of all, does it meet the national inspirations of the side, especially the Palestinian side right now, because the Israelis do have a country? Then the possibility of uh, violence, escalation of violence when this solution will be implemented. Then the issue of the maintaining a Jewish majority in Israel. Then the possibility of civil rights to vote, to be elected, etc. The economical situation after the deal. Uh, of course, unfortunately, we need to see if it is feasible. The chance for reconciliation, which is very important. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Mr. Assad? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Actually, I want to stress first that this is not a new debate. This is an old debate, which started in the early 20th century, uh, mainly by Jews then. But now in the last uh, two decades, three decades, Jews and Palestinians are involved in this discussion. And uh, they both, uh, I mean, in both sides, at least, uh, the ones that seek one democratic state are trying to meet the question how to reach a, a peaceful solution and uh, acceptable solution by the two national groups. 
uh, and um, as you we just hear many things that the only solution is a two-state solution uh, for many people like me and uh, it's not only me by many others like Miron Ben Benesti, Edward Said and many others they think basically that the two-state solution doesn't meet the needs the national needs of the uh, both groups, mainly the Palestinians, because Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza will meet the needs, the national needs of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, will not meet the needs of the national needs of the refugees and Palestinians in Israel. Here I want to thank you for this short film, the film that you introduced us by your students. They refer to, there to the two democratic options, two peaceful options. There are many solutions for the conflict and uh, many of them were used in the, in the past, but including transfer or uh, violent uh, clashes between the two parties. But uh, the two basic democratic solution is the two-state solution and one-state solution. And here I want to refer why I think that we should uh, concentrate in the one-state solution. First, it didn't work. Why it didn't work, the, 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 the two-state solution? Because of many reasons. Many of them are related to the balance of power, but not only. Basically, when we speak about the one-state solution, why the two states doesn't work, we refer to the basic uh, 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 foundations of the facts in the ground. I mean, the settlement, Jerusalem, um, uh, water resources, etc., etc. But we didn't. We do not refer enough to the political framework as a, a one that doesn't permit us to move towards the two-state solution. The, the political logic among in Israel and among the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip is, uh, is, uh, is against the two-state, against reaching a settlement between the two parts. It's not only the Israelis who are moving to the right, uh, I mean the right government, but also Palestinians. They are very, they are splitted. There is no Palestinian national movement then Abu Mazin can sign an agreement in behalf of it with the Israelis. So it is another problem that we should consider when speaking about the one state solution. When I say one state solution, I mean a long term solution. I'm not saying that tomorrow we'll reach a solution. So we already wait since Oslo, at least since Oslo, 25, 26 years, and we didn't reach the two state solution. It seems to me that we will continue with the basic uh, confrontation, more or less in uh, different levels of confrontation and well, we will reach a solution. Why I think the solution should be the one state solution? Because it is the only solution that will give answer to the whole package of the conflict. So the Jewish aspirations in their, what they consider as Eris Israel, what Palestinians consider as their Palestine. Palestine for Palestinians is not the West Bank in Gaza. It's the whole yes. land yes. of uh, mandatory Palestine. What are the foundation? Uh, so this will be meted only in the one state, one democratic state solution. And secondly, we need to clarify what would do we mean by the one state. The one state is a concept that already existed in Belgium, in Canada, in Switzerland, in uh, Macedonia, in the Northern Ireland, in many states. It's not a new one, and it, the basis for it. Is, is two foundations. The, one, the first one, individual political rights as citizens, as Belgians are the state of the Belgium citizen, and of course, a, a kind of non-territorial, non-territorial self-determination. Dr. Oren Iftakhel. Thank you very much. I thank the Charlie Center very much for putting together this event and uh, talking about hope at times where, you know, hope is... Uh, a short supply, uh, and we need to always uh, cultivate the hope uh, in times of conflict. And uh, the context now is, of course, that we are under the shadow of annexation. We're under the shadow of the Trump uh, deal of the century, which promises to be much more of a conflict, of a plan for conflict than a plan for peace. And it hasn't been said yet, and uh, I think we should, it should be stressed. These are the things on the horizon. I saw the clip that the students made. It was very, very nice, very short. It had a whole range of solution between uh, partition to one state solution. But I'd like to enrich your discussion with the idea of a confederation. And this is our approach in the movement a Land for All, Two States, One Homeland. The current context of the conflict uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, present the opportunity for neither two states nor one state. The two states. State solution is a forced partition of the land 
is impossible for many reasons that uh, have uh, already been elaborated after 25 years. 600,000 uh, Israelis have settled uh, beyond the Green Line. Much of the land has been confiscated. There's many, uh, to almost 2 million Palestinians inside Israel. Jerusalem is totally mixed. It's almost impossible to partition the land without major conflict and, and, and dislocations. One state solution that my friend and good colleague Asad Ranem has elaborated is of course ideal, except one issue, is that the Palestinians and the Israelis both have the right for self-determination, both have the internationally recognized right for a state, and no nation in the world will give up that right. It's the highest level of political power and expression. So I think very few Israelis will, and will allow a one-state solution uh, to impinge on what it is the right for Israel to be an independent state. And I think many Palestinians too would uh, prefer to have a Palestinian state. So how do we square the circle? We have a land that is mixed, cannot be partitioned sharply into two states, but one state solution too is against the political horizon, political rights, according to international, international law of Israelis and Palestinians. We offer uh, a path in between. Uh, which is a confederation, which is a solution which is a little bit complex, but nonetheless has worked out in many places around the world and to resolve similar conflicts. And this is on one hand respecting the right for self-determination, the collective right, according to international law, which will be according to the Green Line, there will be a Palestinian state and the Israeli state on the other side of the Green Line. On the other hand, the borders will be open. There will be freedom of movement. And this is because the homeland, the idea of the homeland that Jews and Palestinians are very attached to historically and currently is the same. The Galilee is a Jewish and Palestinian. The West Bank is mostly Palestinian, but Jews have very strong connection to it. The same, the coast uh, and the south where I live are all uh, considered the same homeland. So if you have on the one hand, the two states, but open borders that people can move, visit, shop, uh, uh, come to uh, uh, travel in the entire homeland, then they continue their connection to the homeland. But politically, they have citizenship only of one state. And our confederation agreement, like other confederations around the world, allows people to um, live on the other side of the border, but not to have citizenship. That is, Palestina that will move to Israel will only vote in Palestine. So there will not be a threat to Israeli politics. Jews that move to the West Bank will be allowed to vote only in Israel. Jerusalem will be a, a joint capital in the model of Brussels, which is a capital of two peoples, but one whole entire united city that function as a major metropolis. And instead of the biggest obstacle, it could be actually the harbinger of coexistence and peace. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gilad? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to commend the, uh, the excellent presentation of the uh, ME students uh, for uh, presenting uh, very clearly the, uh, the various options. Now with annexation, perhaps uh, three weeks ahead in the context of Trump's plan, um, it's a, quite an awkward moment to talk about, the, uh, about other uh, solutions, but nevertheless, we'll, I will do that. And I, uh, I of course, concur with uh, Israela that the best way forward would be uh, the two-state solution uh, that would secure a Jewish democratic uh, Israel and a Palestinian statehood. Um, uh, we at the uh, Institute for National Security Studies, the INSS in Israel, uh, on a yearly basis, we, uh, we assess all the, uh, all the options that are on the table, including the two that were presented here. Uh, according to 12 criteria, and by far, every year, including 2020, the two-state solution is in, uh, in the highest priority. However, how to get there? How to get there when there's no talks, when there's no negotiations, um, and we need a transitional stage? This is what I would like to, uh, to talk about. I would like to, to see us preserving the conditions for a negotiated agreement, eventually and to create gradually a uh, reality of two states for two people or two uh, distinct national entities. Uh, by the way, the, 
territorial issue was never the sticking point in all the negotiation rounds. So um, that's not the big, uh, the big problem. So talking about a gradual transition process, I would talk about three prongs. The first one is, of course, bilateral Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. The second one, the th second prong would be uh, a regional um, talks between, uh, between Israel and its neighbors. And the third one would be independent steps that each one of the parties could take that are uh, concurrent with the, uh, the two-state solution and are not negating the negotiation uh, processes. So, um, uh, first, uh, I would like to talk about, uh, not about the bilateral talks because we, we know everything about that. It will end somewhere around uh, the schemes that we, we are all uh, familiar with, uh, the Clinton parameters um, or uh, the Annapolis uh, process outcome. Uh, this, of course, will uh, uh, will make it uh, will make it happen uh, once we uh, proceed uh, gradually in the transition process. Uh, the Arab Peace Initiative could be used as well to, in, to, to should be invigorated. It should be uh, reviewed and modified. Uh, but that's a good uh, a good point uh, to start a regional discourse here. But the most important thing is to have a continuous process, to have it managed, uh, to have it uh, uh, bind the uh, uh, the parties with benchmarks that are uh, that are clear to all and with terms of reference that would uh, would bring about a different reality than the one that we live in today. And when I when when we look at the Jewish people comprising today 14 uh, million only. Uh, and with only one single state as, as, uh, as its homeland, uh, and we have the Palestinians with no self-determination in a state of their own, I think that this is the, uh, this is the best way forward. We attempted to reach that uh, in Camp David 2000 and Taba 2001, in the Annapolis process in 2007 and 8, in the Kerry process of 2013-14, uh, yes, we tried. We did not succeed, as Israel has said. Uh, let's try again, because that's the best. Uh, that's the best scheme to uh, to provide uh, Palestinian self determination and uh, and Israel as a Jewish democratic state uh, living in security. Just one more sentence. We mm -hmm. tried it for uh, two and a half decades, but only uh, about ten percent of the time. Uh, accumulated time, like two, two and a half years uh, of negotiations on permanent status. We need to uh, to put a new paradigm on the table. Whatever is agreed or mutually coordinated should be implemented. And we need to uh, introduce the International Quartet and the Arab Quartet in a gradual, transitional, even-handed, realistic peace process. Thank you. Thank you, Gilad. Now, on to our first question that concerns security. security. So our question is, what would be the security arrangements in each of the proposed solutions for both Israelis and Palestinians? Who will protect the Palestinian state? Will they have a military, an air force, a police force, demilitarization? So our first speaker to answer this question will be, again, Israela, please. Uh, the main concern of both sides, of both the Palestinians and the Israelis, is the issue of the security. The Palestinians want to be secured and the Israelis want to be secured. Uh, so the solution must uh, meet the concerns of both sides. Basically, uh, the Israeli public is afraid of uh, terror attacks, of other issues that, uh, uh, that will uh, jeopardize the security of the citizens of Israel. So there is a solution for all of this, and the solution is uh, quite simple. The solution is a security arrangement that will be put on the borders between the both sides. And as you know, somebody said that borders, they make good, and fences make, make good neighbors. So there will be a security arrangement, border, border regime, border control, there will be passes between the two states that would be controlled by in the Israeli side, by Israelis and the Palestinian side, by Palestinians. And there will be areas that uh, we will need the assistance of a third party 
which will uh, do all the inspections that are necessary for movement of uh, people, of goods. We'd like, we really would like to prevent the uh, smuggling of weapons and of uh, people that have very bad intentions towards Israel or Palestine. As, as I said before, the Palestinian state in all the negotiation, it was agreed basically that we are talking about a Palestinian state that is demilitarized. So it could on, only deal with internal security issues, something similar, similar to the police. But since we are talking about a peace agreement, the relationship between both sides would be such a relationship that will allow both sides to uh, cooperate, by the way, as they did till one month ago, and uh, to benefit from the cooperation, both sides will benefit from the, from the cooperation. There is also a, a, another point that I would like to raise, and this is the Jordan Valley, that everybody now is talking about it, since the plan is to annex the Jordan Valley. It is absolutely not necessary to annex the Jordan Valley because the security arrangement should be uh, based on cooperation between the Palestinian state, the Israel, Israel and, the, and Jordanian. They are, they are doing a very good, they, the Jordanian and the Palestinian and the Israelis are doing a very good job and I don't see any reason to change it. Thank you. Thank you, Israela. Mr. Gilad. Let me first say that we have to differentiate between the, uh, the transitional periods and the interim periods and the permanent status um, uh, period. The permanent status agreement, it's, it's quite clear because this has been discussed and, uh, and I would say uh, very close to be agreed upon previous rounds of negotiations. Um, what I mean by, by that is to say that, uh, that we talk about a demilitarized Palestinian state with a very strong um, uh, internal security and police force. Uh, we talk about a uh, security border uh, in the um, uh, Jordan Valley, not a political border, but a security border where Israel will, uh, will have presence uh, during the first um, 10, 15 years of, um, of the permanent status period. Um, and we talk about um, cooperation between, uh, between the major, uh, mostly moderate Sunni uh, countries in the, uh, in the, throughout the Middle East um, and across the Arab world uh, for regional uh, security and stability with guarantees from, uh, from allies elsewhere. Uh, altogether, I would say that uh, the, the, the only thing that, uh, that was in questionable in the negotiations was whether Israel would, uh, would get a full uh, control over the airspace for military use and a full control over the electromagnetic sphere, uh, which is very dense uh, these days. Anyway, um, bottom line is that with no security, there's no hope. With no hope, there's no stability. And, um, and in the transitional period, we have to draw a border between what eventually will, uh, will uh, stay within Israel borders and what eventually will, uh, will become the Palestinian state. Even if it's a provisional border, we have to differentiate the blocks, the large blocks of settlements and the Jewish neighborhoods in East Jerusalem from all the rest, because these one-digit um, territorial part of, um, uh, of uh, uh, the West Bank will, uh, will become eventually Israel. So until we reach an agreement on permanent status, there's no forced evacuation of settlers uh, until final status. The IDF stays in a, uh, in a moderate, uh, footprint until reaching an agreement and, uh, and in permanent status everything changes and becomes more or less uh, the arrangements and the schemes that, uh, that uh, the Annapolis uh, process uh, attained or the uh, John Kerry round in uh, about six, seven years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheer. Dr. Oren Iftachel. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think overall the issue of security uh, is important, but to some extent it's overrated. It's overrated because what we know about uh, peace processes around the world and their impact on the cessation of violence uh, over time. So our main threat has been uh, for a long time internal violence, especially terror by uh, te terrorist attack by the Hamas, uh, and uh, no threat from the outside. No uh, significant threat has existed towards Israel from the outside, uh, barring the you know about Iran, which you know is a different sphere. It's not part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I would say that the resolution of our conflict and a joint capital in Jerusalem uh, will neutralize even the threat of Iran because they couldn't attack uh, Israel when it's actually in a confederation with Palestine and when the spaces are mixed. Um, so I would say that the oh, main security issue is the management of ethnic relations inside Israel-Palestine. And in that respect, we can see in Northern Ireland, in South Africa, in the Basque country, in East Timor, in most places where there was an amicable, agreed resolution, the terror, the threat of terror has declined very rapidly. Not immediately, but after a few years, terror has stopped. And I think that's what will happen with Israel-Palestine. And uh, we do think, we don't think uh, Palestine should be demilitarized. I think a state should have an army. The army would be in coordination, the two armies in confederation, like in the European Union or like other confederations like Bosnia. They will be coordinated. They will uh, uh, safeguard the external borders. Uh, Israel is safeguard its external border, Palestine its external border in cooperation. Uh, and a good measure of cooperation is happening now too uh, uh, with the Palestinian Authority. And uh, we actually commissioned five years ago a major study by the INSS, what Gilad Sher was talking about. And uh, uh, they also concluded that if the external borders are safe, Internally, between Israel and Palestine, freedom of movement can be uh, uh, very secure. Of course, it goes without saying that non-state organizations like the Hamas and the settlers will be unarmed. Only the states will have the right to use uh, 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 military power. And we think uh, overall, if there is an agreement and reconciliation, is not a major issue and it will be resolved itself quite quickly. The main thing, though, I want to stress is that at the moment, uh, the security discourse favors Israel a great deal. There's a huge imbalance of power between Israelis and Palestinians. We cannot actually say these are two nations negotiating peace. At the moment, Israel occupies and controls the entire state, the entire territory of Palestine. And this is why I think the security uh, discourse and analysis should uh, proceed after we talk about the rights of Palestinians. And I think it's doable. Thank you, Professor Owen. Professor Assad, Ghanem? Yes, uh, thank you for raising this question. I mean, basically it's a tricky question because I think that the two-state solution is not an option, practical option. We already tried it for 26, 28, and I think that we uh, underestimate the political situation in Israel, basically. And as I said before, as, and also among the Palestinians, there is no way for two-state solution. It's over. I think that we just uh, continue with this because uh, many Israelis, at least uh, they are less and less uh, in power, uh, but many Israelis still believe that the only way to do it is by separation. I want to remind, remind you that there is uh, another power in, uh, in, uh, in uh, holding the government in Israel uh, for the last uh, 20 years, and uh, he is changing Israel at all, and he's for the the annexation of the Jordan Valley. He's at the annexation, he's at the, with the annexation of the West Bank. He's uh, promoting uh, what is considered to be a Trump plan, which is Netanyahu plan. It's not Trump plan. Uh, and uh, this is what Israel is ready to, uh, to give. Uh, basically, I want also to mention one, in one note, one thing. I mean, Palestinians are those who need protection, uh, and not the Israelis who need protection. And this is something that we need to uh, consider, whether we go for two states, one state, or the continuous situation, which seems to be continuing with us for many uh, reasons. I want to follow what Oren said before. I think that we are in a complicated situation, in a divided society between in, with, with different levels of citizenship or um, many people without any citizenship. 
but basically we need to seek self non-territorial self-determination. This is also an option that already exists in the world. The only way for self-determination is not only territorial deter self-determination, as uh, my colleagues just uh, argue. The other option is non-territorial self-determination. And what we need to do in order to keep the security of both peoples and the citizens of the future one state is to make a fair deal between the two nations, which will should be based on, a, on saving the basic needs of the two groups. Basically, it is the identity, the security, and of course, the need to be equals. If we reach these goals, then there will be more security for uh, every citizen, more security for the Jews, and more security for the Palestinians. I'm not saying, I'm not naive. I'm not saying that there is no need for the police, there is not no, no need for, for uh, army. But I think that we need to seek peaceful solutions internally between the people, between the nations. In my view, the only option that we should seek is the, the one-state solution. The two-state solution is over. There is no place for it. And continuing prom promoting the two states is to say that Palestinians will continue for another generation under the, the current situation, which is bad. It is, from my point of view, it's bad for Palestinians and for Israelis. And let's give hope for Palestinians and Israelis by promoting an alternative solution, which is the one-state solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghanim. Now, our next question is in regards to the right of return. So the Palestinians are the only people in the world to have maintained a refugee status for 72 years, which makes up for ge four generations. Current estimates th speak of 5.5 million Palestinian refugees, according to the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. How do you suggest resolving the refugee issue, assuming that Israel will continue to resist their return in order to avoid a dramatic demographic shift? The first speaker will be Mr. Sheriff, please. Thank you. Again, uh, this is a permanent status core issue, one of the four core issues of permanent status. I would say the following. There's, a, um, there's an understanding and an agreement that the uh, the Palestinian refugees should be compensated and rehabilitated either in, in Palestine once, uh, uh, once uh, established or uh, in their current places of residence um, and, or in a third party's uh, territory. There's uh, a few countries that uh, offered to uh, absorb um, uh, a, certain, a certain number of uh, Palestinian refugees. This was before um, before the last waves of, uh, of enhanced uh, refugeeism uh, throughout the world, but still uh, this is one of the possibilities. On a case-by-case uh, -case basis, and according to uh, Israel's exclusive discretion, uh, some of the refugees uh, on, on the basis of um, humanitarian considerations, you know, family reunions, etc would be uh, allowed to settle in Israel proper. Um, and, but refugeeism has to end and uh, the right of return should be uh, applied over uh, Palestine once established as an independent and sovereign state. Thank you, Mr. Sheer. Ms. Israel Oron? As for the refugees, I think the only viable solution for the problem is the two-state solutions because First of all, when we are talking about uh, confederation, I'm sure that uh, Professor Iftachel is aware of the fact that before you are dealing with a confederation, you have to establish two states first. Uh, and in, the, in this phase, the initial phase of the two states, maybe we can deal with the uh, refugees the way that we are dealing with them, with the solutions uh, in the framework of two states. Uh, as for one state solution, um, this is a problem because the resistance and the objection in Israel for uh, the return of refugees for Israel is that uh, Israelis are afraid for changing the nature, nature of the state of Israel as a Jewish state. And this uh, argument 
really is not relevant anymore when we are talking about a two-state solution, a one-state solution. It means, and we are talking about a state that the majority of the population will be Palestinians and not Jews. So this is a very interesting issue to deal with for the people that support the one-state solution. Interesting to, 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 to hear the answer for this. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mrs. Leila Oron. Now if we can move to Professor Asad Ghanem again. Basically, I think that uh, the question of uh, refugees is a reservable uh, of, uh, one. It's not something that we cannot deal or resolve it. Uh, when we speak about uh, democratic state, uh, I think that we overestimate the uh, weight of uh, demography because when we speak about one state as a democratic entity, we should uh, concentrate on the democratic foundations and not if there will be uh, one Palestinian more than the Jews or one Jew more than Palestinians. I think that it is, uh, this is just a play to the hand of the, uh, of the extremists on both sides. Basically, I think that we should uh, say, look for resolving the problem of the refugees in two basic, uh, by differentiating between two basic levels. The first level is the, in principle, we have to to agree that there are international resolutions and we should, Israelis, Palestinians, and the international community should respect the international resolution regarding the return of the refugees or getting compensation. This is one aspect. The other aspect is trying to look carefully about the refugees, Palestinian refugees, and how to resolve their problem. Basically, I mean by that, by saying that, that Palestinians in Jordan, there are almost four million, I think, for million Palestinians in Jordan. I guess that the majority of them, they don't want to come back to, to Palestine. Either one state or two states. They want to be and continue to be Jordanians. Many Palestinians who are already in Sweden or in the United States, they want to continue and being still. There is a major problem for Palestinian refugees in, the, in, uh, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, in Iraq, and few other places. And it, either one state or two states should be willing to allow Israel or Palestinians and Israelis should seek the return of these refugees, opening the doors for them. Uh, I'm not sure that all of them will choose to return, but if they want and choose to return, I think nothing will happen to absorb another one, uh, 500 or 300 or 200 Palestinians. Just before two decades, Israel absorbed one million Russians and there was no problem. Israel became more rich and much stronger than before. So let's think openly about the future. I think that there is no way to resolve the conflict without resolving the question of the return of the or getting compensation by the Palestinian refugees. And we should openly seek uh, ending uh, solution for the suffer of the Palestinians, uh, Palestinian refugees. Thank you, Mr. Ghanem. Professor Oman yeah, I'd like to concur with the uh, with the Professor Ghanem, the Palestinian refugee issue is core to the conflict. And until now, it's been shoved under the rug uh, in all kind of uh, very blurred uh, resolutions or statements. And I think Gilad Sher it co continues to return to this Annapolis and Camp David and Taba negotiation, which have failed. And the situation now is further and further away from success in, in this kind of path. So our movement has taken that. Of course, the movement is Palestinian and Israeli. And you're all welcome to look at our sites, and Land for All, at our Facebook and our publications. And we think uh, uh, we need to address it and we need to uh, observe uh, the right of Palestinians to return to their homeland. But according to international law as well, uh, uh, we think the return should be to the state of Palestine all refugees around the world return to their state. Uh, so the nationalization of these uh, refugees will be to Palestine, to the West Bank and Gaza. However, our plan of a confederation, and confederation means that there is freedom of movement, they will be able to also uh, reconnect to the regions from which they were uh, driven out. And if, whether it's Haifa or Yaffa or Nasra or the, the Nakab, the Beersheba area, but not as citizens, right? So they will be able to visit, to shop, to work, 
Uh, so we having a partial solution to the uh, uh, to the right of return, but I think something that will resolve and neutralize the very very basic uh, injustice that is done to Palestinians. Now, one important uh, issue here is that while we are very uh, consider it very important to resolve the injustice that done to the Palestinians, the resolution of this injustice cannot cause a new injustice to Israelis. So Israelis that have uh, purchased uh, housing and land and settled in good faith in areas that Palestinians claim, and sometimes rightfully so, that belong to them in the past, uh, that uh, cannot uh, proceed of dislocating these Israelis. This is not in the West Bank and in uh, areas where they know that this is illegal to settle, but inside Israel, the resolution of the Palestinian refugee issue cannot uh, dislocate uh, Israelis that have actually settled there in good faith. So there is a bit of a complex solution, but nonetheless, very much we think that every Palestinian that wants to return to the homeland should have had the right and should have the right to access for the, home, for the whole homeland. And these are very uh, firm foundation for creating justice towards a resolution of the conflict. Thank you, Dr. Iftakhir. Now for our last question in regards to holy sites. So I would like to ask each one of our panelists in regards to their proposed resolution. A, who do you think will govern the holy basin, the old city and its immediate surrounding? And B, how will the prayer rituals be conducted both between Jews and Arabs? So the first one of our speakers will be Gilad Sher. I'd like to make two points, uh, very quick points on, on, the, uh, on the, the last questions. Uh, first, uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen conflicts that, uh, that lasted for uh, dozens and hundreds of years. Just look at the 800 years of uh, the conflict in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, the fact that, uh, that um, rounds of negotiations were not intensive enough and not, and not uh, close enough to one another fail does not mean that uh, we have to leave it there. That's number one. Number two is that according to Trump's plan, there might be not refugees, but just Palestinians, about 270,000 to 4,000 that would be incorporated within the state of Israel, according to the maps and according to, uh, to the plan. So uh, mind you, this is a big, uh, a big difference from, um, um, from what we suggested as to uh, the resolution of the uh, Palestinian refugeeism altogether. Now to the holy sites, I, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, there is a, uh, a scheme that might work, and this is a special regime over the old city, including in the holy sites, uh, with the preservation of, uh, of the status quo there in terms of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, division between the uh, uh, various uh, monotheistic and other uh, religions. Uh, the old city should come under uh, a, a supervised a special regime, uh, much like uh, uh, some schemes in the past were uh, were uh, laid out. And I believe it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be cut into pieces between uh, between the various uh, believers and the various uh, parties to this agreement. There's a lot of more uh, stakeholders than just the Israelis and the Palestinians in this issue. And this is why it's so sensitive. And this is uh, basically the sticking point in all the negotiation rounds up to now. Thank you, Gilad Sher. Next, we will have Mrs. Israel Aron. First of all, I do agree with Gilad with regards to the Jerusalem issue. However, I, I would like to raise two other points related to things that were said before. I think the assumption that the relationship between the two people uh, is like between uh, Sweden and Norway is wrong. And uh, making plans according to this assumption will cause a lot of troubles. You, you cannot be the, too naive. You have to be optimistic, but you cannot be naive. The, the, the fact that the two people that were fighting each other for the last uh, hundred years are going to live peacefully with each other 
without any uh, security measure is to say the, le the least it is a little bit too optimistic. This is one point. And the other point is the point of annexation that I really want to speak about it because this is some kind of a result of, the, of Trump's plan. And the, the, the main reason that I object, strongly object, among other ob <laughs> objections that I have for this plan is because it really erases and deletes every chance for a two-state solution in the future because it's insane to annex 30% of the West Bank and expect a viable Palestinian state. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Oren Niftachev? Yes, a uh, key issue here. I'm a political and legal geographer, but I'm also an urbanist. That's my other hat. And I think Jerusalem, therefore, is super important, not just because of its symbolic, national, and religious uh, value, but also because it's a living metropolis and it's a it's a it's a city that uh, is very very important for the whole entire israel palestine and cities let's not forget are the future the 21st century is the century of cities that's why our solution invests a lot of thought in the way the metropolitan region of jerusalem will be a, a, a jewel in the crown a terrific uh, a meeting of east and west and will be a, a functioning metropolis, united city, that cannot be separated. And that's the key issue here. There is no way to separate Jerusalem, to partition Jerusalem. The Geneva Initiative tried that, and if you look at their site, and if you look at the plans, it's a nightmare of walls and tunnels. Even the train stations, the design is one floor for the Arabs and one floor for the Jews. This is undoable and also wrong. We think that Jerusalem should be a united metropolitan region, and uh, uh, it has worked in uh, several places around the world and actually could be the, uh, the leading light for conflict. Like the hardest place of the conflict, if it's resolved there, then it will have a positive effect on the rest. Now, the practicalities of it are that uh, in the holy sites, we do uh, share the idea that there should be international management of Christians, Muslim, Jewish religion, and other religions that uh, this area is very, very important for. So uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, for example, will be, uh, uh, will be handled by the Waqf and of course the uh, Jewish areas by the uh, uh, Jewish institution and the very holy sites uh, like the Church of Holy Sepulchre, etc., by the Christian uh, institution, of course, with open access secured for all and security for all. But the real issue for Jerusalem is also the whole region and to, we, we really think that it can function as a binational city that will illustrate the idea that peace can only be achieved through integration, not through forceful separation. Yes, the two nations have the right for self-determination, but can be done in an integrated way. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, have a look at what we offer for Jerusalem and you'll see that it's actually doable uh, and can be an example for the rest of the country. Thank you, Professor Oren Iftachel. Now to Professor Asad Manem. Uh, thank you for raising the question. I share the same views as my colleagues that Jerusalem is uh, one of the major issues facing any future arrangement between Palestinians and Israelis. I think that uh, basically we, we, in any solution, in any solution, we need peaceful solution, I mean, uh, we need to change our state of mind. I mean, if we speak about the peaceful situation, then of course we will be able to agree about uh, how to manage Jerusalem are the holy sites in, uh, in Jerusalem. But we need to think carefully, as uh, Oren said before, about the future of Jerusalem. One, one main reason, and I start uh, promoting, start speaking about the one-state solution in 96, following a report by uh, Shalom Akshav that showed that under uh, Rabin government, there were more settlements in East Jerusalem and the West Bank than in, under Shamir government. Then I start thinking about this one state solution. I think that there is no solution for the regional issue. Jerusalem, the metropolitan Jerusalem, and the whole sides without uh, uh, agreeing about, uh, about changing our, uh, our attitudes toward the future, moving from separation towards integration, from two state solution towards one state solution. And I think that. Anyone who knows what is the situation in Jerusalem knows that there is no way 
for separation in Jerusalem. There is no way except agreeing about joint management, about joint entity in Jerusalem. And if Palestinians and Israelis can reach an agreement, an agreement in, for peaceful solution in Jerusalem, of course they can reach an agreement in the whole land of Palestine, what the Jews call Eretz Israel. So let's move from this kind of thinking that we will continue in confrontation and how we are going to deal with the holy sites in the confrontational situation. Let's move towards another way of thinking. I think that it is possible. It is uh, workable and just we need to think carefully about how to reach this state of uh, peaceful solution for the future. Otherwise, we'll continue being in the same conflict. And I, I recommend calling it Trump plan the war against Palestinians rather than calling it as a peaceful, a peaceful solution plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghanem. Now I will refer us to Shana, my co-worker at the Charney Resolution Center for Q&A from the audience. Shana. Thank you to all of our speakers today. We had a lovely time uh, listening to all of your different opinions. It was um, very diverse and I'm sure everyone will leave this lecture today learn with a new thing or two that they have learned. Um, our chat box was very heated and we would like to thank you for that. Um, it it was um, filled with different opinions and different chats. But uh, the two questions that we have decided to take today is one regarding the voting. How will the Israelis living in Palestine or vice versa be able to vote in their um, election? Over to Mr. Assad. Basically, uh, I think that uh, many proponents of the one state solution, they claim that this one state will not be a democracy will be dominated by Palestinians or Jews. That's, I mean, among Palestinians who reject that the one-state solution, they say this will be dominated by Jews. And among Jews who reject the one-state solution, they say it will be dominated by Palestinians. Democracy means democracy. It will be dominated by the citizens. Then they will need to have election. So how we are going to have this election in this complicated situation is also another question. But basically, in the one-state solution, there will be one government for both nations with two separate autonomies. In autonomy, internal autonomy, there might be, as in many cases, there will be the community will have their own uh, parliament and they will vote for the, their own parliament. Palestinians will vote for their own parliament. Jews will be for, for their own parliament. The, but the superpower will be given to the supra parliament that will be established for both groups for the whole citizens and then we will have one vote for every person who's adult person or any uh, other uh, classification and uh, uh, democracy will be reserved according to uh, equality between people as citizens uh, and not as uh, we have today many are outside the citizenship status, and many are in second star class citizens, first class citizens, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to Professor Oren. Yes, thank you. It's a key question. Um, and of course, uh, we're talking about at the moment, five million people without voting right about the government that is controlling the future. The Palestinians for 53 years haven't had a vote. And the central issue in Israeli politics was and is what to do with Palestinians and Palestine. This is an apartheid situation that we should move beyond and we should give Palestinians the right to vote for their own state. And what we believe in, and this is also answering, we believe that the establishment of a Palestinian state will be in a process that will create a confederation. It's true that Palestinian state has failed to be established under the current circumstances. But with a confederation which has three layers, if you like, three stories of a house, then it's possible also to have Palestinian sovereignty. That is, there is an urban citizenship where people, anybody can vote in a city, very much the model of the European Union. There is a state election where only citizens can vote. That is, Israelis that live in Palestine say if settlers stay under Palestinian sovereignty, they will not have the right to vote in Palestine. They will vote in Israel. And the same with Palestinians that move into Israel in a gradual process, like the uh, Maastricht Agreement in Europe allowed people to move to other countries, but to remain citizen of the original country. 
And there will be the third layer, which Asad Ghanem think it will be the main layer, but we think it will be a bit of a minor layer, but very important. There will be a union. Every person, every citizen, whether Jewish or Palestinian, will have an urban vote, will have a state vote, and will have a union vote. And that will create checks and balances that we've seen in Bosnia, in South Africa, in places, Israel, that have been undergoing years and decades of conflict that has calmed the situation down and resolved it through democracy. So this is our model, and we think it actually is very, very practical and it worked in different places and will work in Israel-Palestine. Thank you so much, Professor Oren. Moving on to Mr. Gilad Sheikh. Thank you. Uh, under the two-state uh, uh, scheme, uh, Palestinians vote for uh, the Palestinian leadership and Israelis vote for the Israeli leadership. That's, uh, that's as simple as that. And even under, uh, within the context of the deficient uh, Trump plan, um, uh, the enclaves which are, uh, which are incorporated within the plan, uh, dozens of enclaves of uh, Palestinians within Israel and Israelis within uh, Palestine to be, uh, they will vote each for, uh, for the respective uh, leadership. Palestinians for Palestine and Israelis for, uh, for Israel. Uh, now, uh, otherwise, you know, all the other schemes, uh, what I see is that uh, in the long term, uh, it, Israel, uh, the, the right in Israel, which uh, believes in the non-democratic state, um, in, in a way, will not, uh, it will not hold for a long time. And, uh, and Eventually, we will have an equal vote for all, which is, uh, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, super democratic in one state. Um, but uh, currently, we have the extremists on both sides that uh, subscribe to it because it ends, basically it ends the Zionist enterprise of a uh, democratic nation state of the Jewish people with the Jewish majority, uh, with equal votes to all. So uh, uh, in that respect, only the two-state solution provides a Jewish democratic Israel and a sovereign, independent Palestinian state. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mr. Gerard. Moving to our next question will be regarding Arab Israelis. Uh, how will they be resettled if they will be resettled? And uh, what would happen to their citizenship and or the effect on their identity? Starting with you, uh, Ms. Israela. Okay, since I'm not uh, Trump's spokesperson, I'm not going to promote this hilarious and stupid idea, sorry but I don't think that this is legitimate or even possible or even logical to resettle citizens from their place and to annex them to another uh, entity that they are, when they are not willing to do it. It is completely illegal and I strongly oppose it. Mr. Assad? As uh, we all uh, already know, Palestinians and Israel are uh, in, in one side, they are considered to be Israeli citizens. and the other side, they are uh, treated as second class citizens. Mm -hmm. So uh, in any case, the, there will be a need to promote their citizenship for uh, equal rights uh, in one or two state solution. Uh, basically, if there will be one state, and I am happy that uh, Gerard Sheer just said before a few minutes that there will be either one Jewish state or one democratic state, or of course, two-state solution. Since I think that there, will be, there is no room for two-state solution, so we have to fight the already existed Jewish domination over Palestine, the whole territory of Palestine, and not only inside the Green Line, and we have to seek one-state solution, but this is my own interpretation. So uh, in the one-state solution, Palestinians and Israel will continue to be Israel, I mean, there will, the one-state solution is not a revolutionary solution. I mean, I'm a professor at Haifa University. I will continue to be a professor at Haifa University. Or in Iftahil is a professor at Berlin University. He will continue to be a professor. The question is whether we are seeking a solution for this conflict as the only way for Palestinians in Israel, Palestinians in the West Bank, Jews in Tel Aviv, and Jews in, uh, in uh, the Galilee. 
the only solution for the future is reaching equality and democracy. As the only way to do it is granting full citizenship for all citizens, whatever their uh, race and gender. And of course, that will, in my view, could be implemented, happened, and the workable solution is the one-state solution with uh, so equal, so. equality and citizenship, full equality and citizenship for all. Thank you. Moving on to Professor Oren. I'd like, I'd like to stress again that the two sides here, uh, the classical two-state solution, are talking about a situation which is impossible. It's impossible to uproot uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of Israelis and uh, also to uh, uh, create a, continue to create a state that is, doesn't have borders like Israel. Uh, on the other hand, the one-state solution doesn't have a political field. There is no, Israel will not give up its sovereignty and nor it should. So uh, our solution tried to integrate the right of Palestine and Israelis with a geography that exists today. And I think confederation or possibly even a future federation that continues to, to uh, safeguard the collective rights of two uh, nations together with the uh, geography of integration is, is what, uh, what uh, is the path for the solution. Now, in that kind of path, the Palestinian minority, the Arab minority of Israel are key players. They are maybe the most important player because they are both Palestinians and Israelis. And I think this is very, very important. They are the, uh, the bridge between the two communities. Uh, as a side comment, I totally I concur with Israel or Ron about the ridiculous, callous, the unbelievable step of the, the Trump uh, uh, plan to try to destabilize the, uh, the citizenship of the Palestinian in Israel. And what right? There's no right under international law to, to take away citizenship from citizens of a state. And that is a disastrous uh, uh, part of that plan and will not happen. It's also in the South, the Bedouins, some of them, and in the Triangle, try to annex them to a state that doesn't exist. Okay? So beyond that, we all agree this is a disastrous step. We think the Palestinian in Israel should have a right of national minority, much like other solutions in Northern Ireland, in Bosnia, in Macedonia, in places where there is stability, the community has collective rights. But also, it will be the leader in uh, human rights, democracy, as we already seen. Yesterday, there was a big demonstration in Tel Aviv, equal, equal representation of Arabs and Jews, and I, it gave a lot of hope that the Palestinian Israel are for security, for equality, for justice, and for peace. So I very much have trust in the cooperation of Jews and Arabs uh, in Israel. Thank you so much. And lastly, Mr. Gilad. The, uh, the Israeli Arabs are uh, Israeli citizens with equal rights uh, and equal duties. So the resettlement of uh, Israeli Arabs in the future Palestine is a non-issue because it will never happen. It is not doable, it is unconstitutional, it is an illegal proposition. You do not transfer uh, citizens from, uh, from one sovereignty to another without their consent. Uh, it's not like uh, you transfer goods from, from one place to another. And, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the way forward requires uh, a gradual disengagement, as I said at the, at the outset, uh, between Israelis and Palestinians, the ones from the others. And when I say Israelis, includes the Israeli Arabs. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I revert back to my colleague, Ophir, to close out the um, webinar. Thank you, Shana. I think the questions that you chose were very interesting. And I can tell from the chat that there was a very heated discussion in the chat from our audience as well. So once again, thank you all for participating in our webinar. It was very interesting to get a glimpse of the possible solutions for peace from all of our panelists and from our participants in the audience. We realize that there are so many different aspects that need to be taken account of before reaching an actual solution to the conflict. But we at the Charney Center really hope that this will stimulate a continuation of discussions that will help build a bridge and lead the path to peace and to change, of course, in the region. So my colleague Shana released a feedback form in the chat below and it was supposed to be sent to your emails. We'd appreciate it if each one of you could take the time to help us reflect on this webinar and for us to improve on our further events. If anyone would like to hear more about our endeavors and get involved with the Leon Charney Resolution Center, 
we really invite you to enter our website and subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oren Ifer, Dr. Asad Ghan, and yeah, Mr. Gilad Sher, and Ms. Israel Oron. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tilly Charney, of course, and Ms. Sally Maron for conducting this panel. We hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ophir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening. <laughs>